As we start building larger programs with more and more code, we need some way to keep our code organized. There are a few different approaches we could take for organizing code. Let's start with an example. Say we're building a graphical user interface, where we want to support drawing a variety of different kinds of objects to the screen. We want to support buttons, checkboxes, and text boxes, for example. In addition to drawing those objects, we also want to make sure users are able to click on them and highlight them as well. As we build this system, we have to make some choices about how to organize our code. We could organize our code by function, organizing all the drawing code together, all the code for clicking together, all the code for highlighting together. But another approach is to organize code by object, group all the code for buttons together, all the code for checkboxes together, all the code for text boxes together. One key advantage here is that it becomes easy to add new kinds of objects. We can do so without needing to modify any of the code for the existing objects. This approach to programming is object-oriented programming, and it turns out to be a useful programming paradigm for organizing functionalities together with the data they operate on. So let's try to write some code for drawing shapes to the screen using an object-oriented approach. How might we try to implement this idea using the language constructs we already know about? We want to define a type for a displayable element that will include functions that operate on that element. We have a few different ways we can construct types that combine multiple values, and one of them is the record, which lets us combine multiple values by giving a named label for each. So we could define our type displayElt to be a record. For now, we'll let the record just contain a single field draw that contains a function for drawing the element, though we'll soon see that we could also add other functions to this record type too. Once we have this type, we can try to build values of type displayElt by defining a draw function for them. To do so, we'll use OCaml's graphics module, which for brevity, we'll just abbreviate to a module called G. With the graphics module, we could create a displayElt that draws a rectangle. We'd let the draw field of a record called rect be some function that first uses the graphics module to set the color to black, and then fills a rectangle starting at a particular xy coordinate and with a given width and height. This is a value of type display elt, and it represents one specific rectangular display element. But we'd probably like to have a more general way of creating rectangular display elements that might be located at any point and have any width and height. So instead, we'll define rect to be a function that accepts a point, where a point contains some x and y value, and rect will also accept a width and height, and then return a value of type displayElt. When we call the function and provide it with a point, width, and height, we'll return a display element whose draw function will draw a black rectangle whose center is that point and that has the given width and height. We could use similar logic for defining functions for circle and square as well. Each is a function that takes arguments for the position and size of the shape and then returns a display element. The advantage of making sure all of these values share the same type display elt is that we can write code that works with display elts, and that code will work with rectangles and squares and circles and any other future values of this type that we define later. For example, we could write a function draw that accepts any display element as its argument and works just by calling the function in the draw field of the display element itself. We might think of these as very simple objects. All an object of this type is able to do is draw itself. We could give our display elements additional functionality. We might add functions for getting and setting the position of a display element, as well as functions for getting and setting the color of a display element. But in order for a display element to have a position and color that could be updated, we need some sort of mutable state that a display element has access to, some place where we can store the current position and color in such a way that they might be changed later. References end up being a good solution to this problem. For example, we could define our function circle to accept a point p and a radius r and return a display element. When the function is called on a particular point and radius, we first define references to the circle's position and color, and we use those references in the record the function returns. To get the position or color, we dereference the corresponding reference and return the value stored, 
And to set the position or color, we update the value stored at the corresponding reference. These references are defined inside the body of the circle function. So every time the circle function is called, that is to say, every time we generate a new circle object, we'll get new references that only that circle has access to. The object-oriented programming paradigm has particular terminology for what we've created here. This data structure that potentially combines data as well as functions for working with that data is an object. The functions contained within the object are known as methods, and we say these methods are invoked when we call them. The state variables stored by the object, in this case the position and color, are the object's instance variables. The class interface specifies what methods the object provides, and the class specifies a way to create a new object, otherwise known as instantiating the object. Many languages, including OCaml, also offer particular syntax for object-oriented programming. So instead of using objects implemented directly as records, as we've seen so far, let's instead implement these display elements using the object-oriented syntactic support provided by the OCaml language. First, we can start by defining an interface, a specification of what methods an object will have. To do so in OCaml, we can use the class type keywords followed by the name for the interface, in this case, displayElt. And we'll say that objects of this class type will have a method draw that returns unit, a method set pause that takes a point and returns unit, a method get pause that returns a point, a method set color that takes a color and returns unit, and a method get color that just returns a color. Now we can define a class that satisfies this interface. For example, we could define a class called circle. Recall that a class specifies how we create a new object. So in this case, we're going to say that when we provide the circle class with a particular point and radius, what we'll get back is an object of type displayElt. What will that object be? We'll start the object definition with the keyword object. Inside of our object, we can have both data in the form of instance variables and methods that offer functionality. So what data does our circle need? We need a position that we'll call pause, which is going to be a mutable value because we might want to change the position later. Its initial value will be p, the first argument we passed to the circle class. We also need an instance variable color that stores the color of the circle. It's also mutable because we might change the color, and its color is initially black. In addition to our instance variables, we can define methods to implement the functionality for our object. SetPause will be a method that accepts an argument point p, and once invoked, the method will update the value stored in the pause instance variable to be this new value p. Note that we use the left arrow syntax in objects to update an instance variable. GetPause will be a method that just returns the value of the pause instance variable. And our methods for setColor and getColor are similar. One updates an instance variable, the other one returns the value stored at that instance variable. Once we conclude with the keyword end, we've finished the definition of our circle class. The circle class now represents a way to generate circular objects of type displayElt, where each circle stores its own position and color and can have those values updated and can be drawn. How do we use our class? Well, the first thing we'll often want to do is create a new object with the class otherwise known as instantiating the class. We can do so with the new keyword. So we'd say new, followed by the name of the class, followed by any arguments to the class. What we get back is an object value, a value that contains data for its position and color in this case, as well as methods for working with the data. To invoke a method, we can use the object name, followed by a hash symbol, followed by the name of the method and any of its arguments. So this method invocation, for example, sets the color of the object to red. And to draw the shape, we would just invoke the draw method on the object. In the same way that we've defined our class for circles, we could define classes for other shapes too. Here, for example, is a class for rectangles that also generates objects of type displayout. But one thing you might notice here is that there's a lot of redundancy between this class and our circle class. In both cases, we've defined instance variables for position and color, as well as functions for getting and setting them. 
The difference is really just in how these shapes are drawn to the screen. To avoid this redundancy, we can take advantage of a key feature of object-oriented programming, inheritance. Inheritance allows one class to inherit behavior from another class, so that the same behavior can be shared between classes without needing to repeat code. In other words, right now, both circles and rectangles are separate classes that implement all of their own functionality. Instead, what we can do is define a more general class called shape, which will implement the behavior that's common to both circles and rectangles, getting and setting positions and colors. And then the circle and rectangle classes will inherit from the shape class so that they don't each need to separately implement the same behavior. So let's define the shape class. What will its type be? For this, we might define an interface shape elt that specifies that objects of this type will have methods for getting and setting position as well as getting and setting color. Then we could define our shape class to accept a point as an argument and return a shape elt. When we instantiate the shape class, we'll get an object with instance variables for position and color, as well as methods for getting and setting them. Now that we have this common behavior in a shape class, let's try to implement circles and rectangles. But circles and rectangles do more than just implement the methods in shape elt, they also need to implement a draw method that defines how to draw that shape. So we could redefine our type display elt that includes all the same methods for getting and setting position and color, as well as a method for drawing. But this is redundant code. Instead, we'll have the display elt interface inherit from the shape elt interface. In other words, a display elt will have all the same methods as shape elt, but we can also add the additional method for draw. Display elt, we say, is a subtype of shape elt, or alternatively, shape elt is a supertype of display elt. Rectangles and circles will be classes that instantiate objects of type display elt, meaning they'll have all of the same methods as a shape elt, plus an extra method for drawing. So let's implement those classes now. For our rectangle class, it's still going to accept a point, width, and height. But rather than define the new instance variables directly in this object, we're instead going to inherit from the shape class, passing in the point p as an argument. Remember that the shape class already implements the instance variables and methods for working with position and color. So rather than redefine it here, we're just going to inherit from the shape class. Our rect class is now a subclass of the shape class, or alternatively, shape is a superclass of rect. The draw method is going to look pretty similar to what we've written before, but there's one problem. Because the instance variables pause and color are now inherited, we can't refer to them directly. Instead, the only way to access them is by calling the methods we've defined for getting their value. To do so, we'll give the current object a name by adding it after the keyword object. You could choose any name, but here we'll choose this to make clear that it's a name referring to this current object. Now to draw a rectangle, we'll set the color to whatever color we get after invoking the getColor method on this. That method will return for us the shape's color. And similarly, for filling in the rectangle, we'll use the getPause method to get the current position of the object and return it. The advantage of writing our code this way is that now when we define new shapes, we don't need to constantly duplicate code. To define a class for circles, for example, we could perform the same inheritance from the shape class and just define a draw method for how to draw a circle. And defining a class for squares is even easier. A square is just a rectangle where the height and width are the same. So we could define a class square that just inherits from the rect class using the side length of the square as both the width and the height. The result is that the square class inherits all of the behavior from the rectangle class, including how to draw it, without needing to write any square-specific methods of our own. There are a few other points worth noting about object-oriented programming. First, sometimes we'll run into cases where we want a class to inherit the behavior from some other class, but we don't want the subclass to behave exactly the same way. We might want to make some changes to the inherited methods. To do that, we can override methods we've inherited. For example, we've already defined a class for rectangles, 
that are drawn as filled in rectangles of a particular color. Say we wanted to also define a class for bordered rectangles, which are of a particular color, but are drawn as only the outline rather than filled in. We can inherit a lot of the behavior from rectangles here, but the drawing needs to be different. Rather than draw a filled in rectangle in the shape's color, we'll instead want to draw a slightly larger rectangle in the shape's color, and then draw the regular sized rectangle in white so that visibly we only see the border. To do that, when we define our class border rect, we can inherit from the rect class, but give the inherited superclass a name, in this case, super. Then we can override the definition of draw. We're using an exclamation point after method here to indicate that even though the class we're inheriting from defines draw already, we want to override that definition. Our new definition of draw can then handle drawing the slightly larger rectangle and then call super draw to invoke the superclass's original version of the draw method to draw the regularly sized rectangle. And finally, one other situation we might run into with object-oriented programming in OCaml is this. Say we defined a function set to red that accepts a shape element and sets its color to red by invoking the setColor function. What were to happen if we create a new rectangle and then call set to red on this rectangle? In this case, we actually get an error. The reason is that set to red is expecting us to provide a shape elt but instantiating the rect class gave us objects of type displayElt. But as we know, displayElt is a subtype of shapeElt, so we should be able to use it any time we need a shapeElt. But OCaml's type inference system doesn't have the ability to determine that on its own, so in this case we need to help it. We can use the colon greater than operator to instruct the call to set to red to treat the rectangle as a shapeElt and now the code will work without error. Ultimately, object-oriented programming involves new ways of organizing our code, storing data in instance variables and functionality into methods, and inheriting from classes and interfaces as needed to avoid repetitive code. In cases where we want to store data and functionality together, making it easier to define new classes of objects our programs might want to work with, the object-oriented paradigm can be a valuable programming tool.